and see. So if there's anybody in the back that hears me, and I'm sure somebody will, uh, we need one copy of the notes. Here they come right now. Also, I forgot to mention uh, in the prayers, uh, pray for John Paul. John had a uh, John had a heart cath done yesterday, and uh, I talked to his wife. You can open your Bible to Romans 16, by the way. I talked to Melody, and she said doctor came out, said everything was excellent, no blockage, no problems whatsoever, and then John started to see spots in front of his eyes, uh, which made them fear a stroke, and so one thing led to another, and they couldn't find any bleeding or anything, but uh, as far as I know, John was getting home today, but I, it sounded like it was quite a roller coaster ride, so... If you would pray for John Paul, I know that John would appreciate your prayers very, very much. Okay, Romans 16 tonight. We have come to the last chapter of the book, and I don't know where we're going to go next. I, I Maybe, just maybe, somebody had said something to me Sunday, and it's something that I've wanted to do. We did a little bit of an overview years ago, uh, and it's been quite a while, but I would like to do an in-depth study of the book of Esther. So we may jump back to the book of Esther because I think that's what's coming up. Is that what the church is going to go see at sight and sound? So that you look at Esther and it's not very many chapters. You think, well, we'll be f through that before November, but you know better than that. Uh, we'll do our best to get through it before November. Uh, but I thought that would be great setting us up, getting ready for that, uh, for the trip to sight and sound. So that may be where we go. And Steve was just down. Uh, they took a trip and said that play was absolutely amazing. So that may be where we go. But we're not there yet because we still have some things to finish up here. And, and we have come to six in the chapter 16 in these first 16 verses, which you have a tendency to rush right through because some of these names are extremely difficult to pronounce, as you shall see. I'll call on you if I have trouble pronouncing them, so get ready. Uh, I'll pick out people. Gary Furry. Uh, <laughs> not really. I won't do that to anybody. Y'all won't show up next week if I do it. Let me start at the introduction. Here's what it says. Tonight in our study of the closing remarks of Romans, we're going to step into chapter 16, and as the reader enters chapter 16, there's a tendency to skip quickly through the first 16 verses because in these verses Paul will commend some of his fellow labors. I want you to notice the words of Noel on the 16th chapter. And there are a lot of guys that have very similar comments. This just happens to be a commentary that I have at home. And here's what Noel writes, and I quote, The 16th chapter is neglected by many to their own loss. It is by far the most extensive, intimate, and particular of all the words of loving greeting in Paul's marvelous letters. No one can afford to miss this wonderful outpouring of the heart of the apostle toward the saints whom he so loved, which means all the real church of God, unquote. So here's what you have in these 16 verses. And you're going to see this as we go through. You're going to have a list of people that meant so much to the apostle Paul, and he takes time to name them. Some of them we don't know very much about, as you will see tonight. Some of them we don't have a lot of information, but I find it very interesting to me, and what an honor for these people, that in this writing, in the inspired writing, that God chose to enter their names in his word that will be preserved for all eternity. It's quite an honor. It's quite an honor. Ordinary, average people that were used, that gave themselves so that they could be used, and they got named. They got named in the book that will last for all eternity. By the way, our names are in the book too, in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so that book will also last for all eternity. But I found this to be very interesting for the service. So we're going to start tonight. We're going to get a few of these. Some of them, like I said, we're not going to know a lot about them. Some of them we will. Uh, so I've called this the, the commendation of fellow believers. And the first one that he touches on is a lady by the name of Phoebe. Watch verse 1. Here's what he says. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is the servant of the church, which is at Centuria, 
Now, I find it interesting that he starts out with a lady. A lady makes the top of the list. There's a lot to be said about that. But watch what I have on your paper. The first person who Paul recognizes is Phoebe. She was a sister in the Lord and, ha and a fellow servant. It is believed by many that Phoebe was the person who carried this letter to Rome and delivered it to the saints. Let me stop for a moment. Some people believe that Phoebe was a well-to-do business lady. And so she would have made that journey many times. And so because of that, she was entrusted with the letter. We don't know that. There's a lot of things that are presumed about a lot of these people. But I'm not going to get into those too much because we don't have those details. And so if we were going to use our imagination, we could paint these people however we wanted to. But that's not for us to do. We're not going to rewrite God's word. So we'll take it for what it is. And so uh, let me go back to your paper. In the first six verses, Paul mentions five people, and three of them are women. This tells us that women are not second-class Christians in the body of Jesus Christ. First Peter, this brought a verse to mind. First Peter 3, 7 says this, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Peter tells us women are heirs together of the grace of life. We all serve the very same Savior, only in different capacities. Watch the words of Zeller here, and I like this, and I quote, Biblical Christianity, in spite of what its critics say, has always dignified womanhood and allowed believing woman, women to find their full satisfaction and joy of being the persons God would have them to be. It is in societies where biblical principles are not honored that women are horribly mistreated and held in low esteem. So any place Christianity is taught, women are held in high esteem. They are, they are permitted to have the place that God would have them to have. And here we see as we go through this, as you, as you have uh, five people and three of them are women that are mentioned right off the top. Very significant, had a very important part in the ministry uh, around the Apostle Paul. Let me go on. Now let us get back to Phoebe. She was a sister and a servant that's an interesting word. Let me go back and read the verse. Watch this. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. Okay, now that's, that word servant's thrown some people off. Watch this. She was a sister and a servant from the church at Centria. This was the eastern part of Corinth. Uh, I could. There's a lot to be said about that. Just the area that she came from speaks volumes about her. Very... Uh, immoral area, uh, an area that was that was deep into immorality and, and debauchery. And we talked a lot about what Corinth was like and, and what, the, uh, what the society was like in that day. But, and she was submerged into that, but she got saved, and so she rose above that. Now she is not here. She is a, she is a, a child of God. She is a child of light. And so she has come out of the darkness, so to speak. We don't know much about her background, but let me go on. The word servant, okay, here's where the confusion comes in. In this verse is the very same word used for deacon in other verses. For this reason, many have used Phoebe to say women held the office of deaconess in the early church. And many churches even have women who serve under that title today. And, and I was surprised by reading through some commentary, I was surprised at how many how many commentators want to want to create de, uh, the office of a deaconess from the use of that word right here. I was very surprised about that. Uh, I did not realize that. But watch what I have here. It says I do not believe that Phoebe was a deaconess, nor do I believe that there was such an office in the early church. And I say this because the office is never directly mentioned nor is there ever a list of qualifications as there is for a deacon. So you would think that if God was going to have deaconesses, uh, that there would be a list of qualifications and that that office would be called out, and it's not. And for that reason, I say that there was not the office of a deaconess. There was not. And here's what it says about a deacon. A deacon let me just say this. Let me give you this. Deacons were chosen to be able to help the pastor carry the weight in the church so that he didn't have to 
run himself and spread himself out so thin that he didn't have time for the study of the Word of God. That's, that w that's the idea behind deacon. It's a servant to serve under the pastor. Now, I will say this about Phoebe. In her service, she is called a servant, which it's that same word that's used for deacon. So while she may not have held the office, and I don't believe she did, but yet she still helped to relieve the pressure on the spiritual leaders so that they could give their time to prayer and the study of the Word of God. So she still filled a very important slot. But let me show you. Here's what the Bible says about deacons. In 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, it says, Likewise must deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let those, let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness and faith which is in Christ Jesus. So though that's the, the that's the qualifications for the deacon, but you don't have anything for a deaconess. And so therefore, I, I don't think you can take Phoebe's uh, title of being a servant of the church and say, well, that she was a deaconess, and so therefore that was an office that existed. I don't think you can do that because I think you're writing something into God's Word that is not there. And so I'm not going to do that. If somebody else wants to do that, that's on them. But I don't see it. I don't see the qualifications. And so I say this, that she was a servant. Watch what the next line. Most likely the word servant is used to Phoebe just as a helper and not an official title. That's probably what she was. She was a very good helper. When there was a need and she could contribute to the need, she stepped in. She carried a lot of weight that helped out the spiritual leadership. Watch verse 2. Paul says, okay, writing to the Romans, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that she assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Okay, so that gives us a little bit more details about her. Watch what I have here. We're told in this verse that Phoebe had been a succor of many and of Paul. I want you to notice the definition of that word succor. It is, and I quote, a female guardian, protectus, patroness, caring for the affairs of others and aiding them with her resources, unquote. You see what she did? She was there to help fill a slot. If there was a slot that needed filled, that a woman could fill, not a place of leadership. That's not what, that's not what is, that, that God has given to women, not in a place of leadership, not in a place of teaching men, teaching kids, yes, teaching other women, yes, but not ruling over men. And so when there was an opening, she was there. She was there to, to use probably her resources uh, and to do everything she could to make it easier on the apostles in their service to the Lord. Let me go on here. Watch this. When I think of Phoebe and the, air, and the area she came from, I understand that she was living the fulfillment of Ephesians 5, 1 through 4. Remember, we studied this just recently in Ephesians. It says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So she came out of the area of Corinth. So she came out of what verses 3 and 4 on the screen would just really would, the, the opposite of what's said here, uh, we're not to be a part of that. That's what Corinth was like, the fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, and, and the filthiness, and the foolish talking, and all of that. That was saturated in Corinth, and so she would have no part of that. In verse 2, whenever it says that, that we're to walk in love as Christ loved us with a sacrificial love, that was her. That was Phoebe. That, we don't know a lot about her, but we just from what's said here, she was a woman that was willing to give of herself to be able to make sure that the kingdom of Christ was furthered, that the gospel was furthered. 
Watch verse 2 again. Let me read it. That ye receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she had been a sucker of many and of myself also. Back to your paper. Paul exhorted the church at Rome to do two things for Phoebe. Number one, they were to receive her in the Lord as become a saint. This means they were to receive her into fellowship with them. Now, you've got to understand something. If they did not know somebody, they had to be very careful because of the false teachers, because of the false apostles. They had to be very, very careful in who they received into the fellowship. Paul says, receive her. Take her into the fellowship with you. Number two, they were to help her with any need that she may have had. If she had a need, whatever it would be, they were to help her. Watch this. We do not know what Phoebe did as far as working, but we do know that she carried one important, and I want you to catch this, she carried one very important letter to Rome and delivered it to the church. She may not have known exactly what she had in her, her, in her possession, for she may not have known the letter was inspired by God and that it was his word. I'm sure that she did not know how many lives would be changed by this letter in her hand. I, I'm, I'm, I'll venture to say this. She really did not know what she carried. She had no idea. What's the application? Let us also be reminded that when we serve the Lord, we have no idea how many lives will be touched or, or by what we do. Our service, just as Phoebe's, may have an impact upon lives of people long after we are gone. Therefore, let us serve the Lord with joy and gladness. Let us put his work first and not ours. And keep in mind Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. You and I sometimes think, well, what I'm doing isn't very important. It's not very big. It's not, it, I'm not up front. I'm not, I'm not in front of people. Listen, that doesn't make any difference. Neither was Phoebe. Neither was Phoebe. She carried a piece of paper, she, uh, uh, not more than a piece of paper, she carried a, a uh, parchment paper, scrolls, to Rome and delivered them to that church, which would be the eternal word of God. She was the one that would transport that from the Apostle Paul to the church, not knowing what she was carrying, not knowing the impact of that, the significance of what she did. Just carrying the scrolls to get them there was so very important. So don't ever think that what you do isn't very important. It always. We'll talk about something at the end of this. The next two people that are mentioned, familiar people, Priscilla and Aquila. Watch uh, verse 3. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Come back to your paper. This husband and wife team were Paul's helpers in the Lord. They had developed a relationship, and it started because they were of the same trade, the same occupation, really. In Acts 18, 1 through 3, watch this. It says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So here was a meeting that took place. They, they met because they were of the same occupation and also of the same, the, the same interest in the same God, if I could put it that way. They no doubt got saved through the Apostle Paul's ministry. Watch the next paragraph. From the time that they met, they remained really close companions. It started with sharing the same trade, and it grew from there. They came to know the Lord, and they served God faithfully their entire lives through that whole trade thing. And I'm going to use that for a moment, and I'm going to show you something. Watch this application. I just need to remind all of us that the people we meet in life are often divine appointments. Let us notice something from the life of Jesus. John 4, 3-7. You know the scene. It says, He left Judea and departed again unto Gal into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. In other words, it was vitally important that he go by the way of Samaria. Watch why. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. 
Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, and there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And you know the rest of the story. But watch this. The Bible tells us that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And the reason was is because there was a woman whom he would meet at the well. She would get saved, and she would then testify before the men in the town, and many of them would get saved. I point this out because there are times when God redirects our paths because there is a divine appointment that we must keep. There may be someone whom God will have us to meet that does not know the Lord, or they may know the Lord, and he wants to, wants to use them in our lives or us in their lives. But it's a divine appointment. And so that I say that to help you with something, that sometimes your plans are going to get changed, and sometimes mine are going to get changed. And if you're like I am, I don't like it sometimes. And I, and, and I need to learn to accept those things better. Because God has divine appointments. He has people that we come in contact with because maybe they need something from us or maybe later on they will be able to contribute something and help us out or maybe they don't know the Lord. And so we end up being the Jesus Christ that they will meet. But a lot of times we miss those appointments. And I'm going to tell you why, because I've already lived it. And that is because many times we are so focused on ourselves and what I want to do and what I have planned and making sure that my plans fall together, come together the way that I think they will. Uh, we need to look at that. I need to look at things a whole lot different. As I come through this chapter right here, I realize when I see Priscilla and Aquila and how they got together, so it's so important, so simple but yet it was a divine appointment. Watch uh, 16.4. He goes on about them. Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not, not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. What's your paper? We do not know the details, but there was a situation where Priscilla and Aquila risked their lives to preserve the life of Paul and many people benefited from it because the Gentile churches were thankful. Reminds me of 1 John 3.16. It says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that's exactly what they did. Let me read uh, 5a. Watch what it says here in the beginning. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Okay, here's something that you need to understand that back then they didn't have church buildings like we do today they met in houses and these people priscilla and aquila had the church meeting in their house watch this watch your paper at the top of page five here we learn a little more about this couple they were hospitable they opened their home for the church to meet the background commentary has some interesting insights on the early church. Watch this, and I quote, Small synagogues sometimes had to meet in homes before they could purchase buildings. Many Greek religious associations did the same. Churches did so for the first three centuries. Watch this. Using their income to buy slaves freedom, feed the poor, and so forth, rather than to build edifices. In Rome, many to do well-to-do apartments existed above the shops in multi-story tenement buildings. Aquila and Priscilla probably lived above their artisan shop, unquote. So they didn't have the buildings like we do. But these people, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, not only did they lay down their life for Paul, but they also opened up their home for the church to me. That would take a lot because... The, if, if, you, if you and I go back, here's something interesting to look at. There was one church in those cities that existed. One church, not multiple churches. There was one church that existed. And the populations of some of those cities were very, very big. Let me keep going. There's something which really stands out con, uh, uh, concerning this couple, and that is they were surrendered to the Lord. I got three things here. Number one, their time was given to the Lord. In Acts 18, 18a, we read this about them. 
And Paul, after the, this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. So uh, they joined him on the second missionary journey. So they gave their time to the Lord. The second thing I have, their lives were surrendered to the Lord. They had laid down their own necks for Paul. The third thing, their possessions were surrendered to the Lord. They used their house as a place to gather. So here you have a husband and a wife working together that are surrendered over to the Lord. Very, very important. People that were used in ways that you and I can't even begin to imagine, that contributed to the gospel reaching you and I ultimately. The next person. Epinatus, watch 16.5, watch this guy. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Okay, just a little bit about this individual. This individual held a special place in the heart of Paul because he was the first convert out of Asia, the first one out of that area. Paul never forgot Epinatus. Apparently, the two stayed in contact until death. A very good friend. A very good friend. That, that along the line was there for the Apostle Paul. Then the next one that you come to is a common name, Mary. I like these. They're easy to pronounce. 16.6. Watch this one. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. That's all you get. But you get a lot in that. Watch this. We know nothing of Mary except what's stated here. We're told she bestowed labor on Paul and on his fellow servants. The meaning of much labor is that she labored to the point of weariness and exhaustion. That's the meaning right there. This Mary reminds me of another companion of Paul who labored with the same fervor. And you read about him in Philippians chapter 2, 25 through 30. It says this, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger... And he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that ye heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, not on him only, but on me also, lest that I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And I send him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive ye therefore in the Lord with all gladness. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such a reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his own life to supply your lack of service toward me this guy Epaphroditus stood in the gap where the Philippians could not make it when they couldn't fill the hole this guy did watch verse 30 again because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Not that they lacked, not that they didn't want to do it, but they couldn't fulfill what they wanted to. They couldn't do what Paul needed. And so this guy steps up and he does it. But this marries the same way. She labors to the point of weariness and exhaustion. She does not give up. She continues to serve. And so she finds her name written in Romans 16:6. Forever in the Word of God because of what she has done. Watch uh, these next two. Uh, I forgot to advance that. Adronicus and Junia. I'm happy I got me through all the names tonight, and I can practice on another, the other ones next week. Watch this. Verse 7. Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, there's an interesting statement, I'll come back to that in a minute, who are of note among the apostles. There's another interesting statement. Who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. There, this verse has a tremendous amount in it, and I don't have time because I'm going to finish out with this, uh, but I'm going to give you the high points of it. Watch what I have here. This may have been a husband and a wife, team possibly but we cannot be sure whoever they were they were number one kinsmen of paul now watch this this could mean they were family members of paul or it could mean that they were jews 
Some people say they were family members. Some people say they were Jews. And the ones that say they were family members say that Paul never greeted all the Jews by saying, my kinsmen. So whatever, whoever they are, we don't know that. We don't know that. Whether they were fellow Jews or whether they were actually family members, but they made a difference. Number two, watch this. They were fellow prisoners. Fellow prisoners. Paul was in prison many times. Many times. Not just in Rome, but he was in prison many times. And in one of his prison stays, these two were also in prison for their faith. So they were fellow prisoners also. They had been in the same prison. Number three. They were note among the apostles. This is an interesting statement. These two were not apostles, but this probably means they were outstanding servants with the apostles and under the apostles' authority. In other words, they were well known, and, and they probably came from Jerusalem because the next thing we're going to see is they were in Christ before Paul. They were saved before him. Before he was saved on a Damascus road, these people were saved. So they, they no doubt, they probably worked with the apostles. They were a very, very helpful uh, two people to assist in the ministry of the apostles in the early church. And number four, and you wouldn't think much about this, but this is important, and I'll explain why. They were in Christ before Paul. See what it says in that verse, verse 7 again? Who also were in Christ before me. Now, let me show you why that's important. This is a very important statement because there are many who believe the church started when Paul was saved. Churches around here. They are called ultra-dispensational churches. And th here's what they preach in their own WJSM. And I'm not going any further than that, but there are three of them that I know. I'm not going any further than that. But they will, t they will argue with you that the church started when the Apostle Paul got saved. That's, when it, that's what they will tell you. We believe the church started on the day of Pentecost. This is a verse here. If I ever talked to him again, I would come back to this. Because I would ask this. If the church started with the Apostle Paul, then how could these two people, Adronicus and Junia, be in Christ before Paul if the church did not exist before him? How would that be possible? It wouldn't be. Which just reinforces what we believe here, that the church started at Pentecost is where the church started, not with the Apostle Paul. So anyhow, conclusion. Let me get you down to an end tonight. I could go on and on. There's, we could take those people and expound upon them and we could imagine a whole lot, but we don't have a lot of information, so we'll take what we have. And I will say this to you. From the names that are listed here, we see the need for all believers to be available for the Lord to use. We are one body, and we need each other. One person cannot do it. Five people cannot do it. Twelve people cannot do it. The apostles could not do it on their own. They needed people in their lives to help them. We work together. We function together as a body. Everybody has a gift, at least one. And that's why it's so very important that you exercise your gift because when you don't, the entire body suffers because you don't exercise your gift. That's just the way it is. That's the way God made the body of Christ. And so I, I also look at this and I say this to you, that you may feel like you're not very significant. And I say this, these are ordinary people. They're ordinary people that made themselves available, that made themselves available, that put God's work ahead of their work and said, you know what, Lord, here I am, send me. Whatever you want me to do, if it's to assist the pastor, if it's to assist in the church somehow, some way, if it's to run the sweeper, if it's to clean the bathrooms, if it's to shovel snow, if, if it's to help set up tables, and now y'all ought to run over and set them up tonight. Brenda, you can thank me later. Uh, 
Whatever. Whatever. We're all needed. That's the point. We're all needed. Don't look at me and think, well, the pastor's more important than I am. Listen, God called me to be a pastor. I'm up front, but I need you folks. The church needs you. And that's why it's so important that we function together and that we function in unity. It's so very important. And someday, someday, and we'll get into this next week, that God remembers everything that you do, no matter how small you might think it is, he is there watching, and he will remember. And that will be brought up at the judgment seat of Christ. You will be rewarded for your service there. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just the verses that we come through tonight. Lord, these people that were in the life of the Apostle Paul, Phoebe and Priscilla and Aquila and Mary, who we know very little about, Adronicus and Junia, Lord, who we know very little about. These people, Lord, that were used by you, and we know they were significant. They got their names recorded in your word for all eternity. Ordinary, common people that presented themselves were there, made themselves available. Lord, let us be that way. Let us be that way. Let us be willing to serve, to put your work first ahead of everything else, not mine, not my desires. Lord, uh, help us to be mindful of those divine appointments whenever our plans get redirected and they get changed because there's somebody that you wanted us to meet. Maybe they would later become somebody that would be able to assist us or somebody that we could later assist and help them, or maybe there's somebody that don't know Christ as Savior. And so we are the Jesus that they will meet. Father, tonight, take us home safely, I pray. Bring us back on Sunday, uh, ready to be taught by the Holy Spirit. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.